I want to talk to you today about real men, real men. This is not real men of genius, but real men. Uh, and um, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It was interesting that when I started thinking about men, you know, I thought about this passage, for all fall short. We all fall short and, uh, uh, of the glory of God, no matter who you are, that you can be maybe the, considered the most holy person in this place, or the person who is not deemed to be that spiritual. But yet, it doesn't make any difference. All of us fall short. And, of course, in that context, men fall short. And so, which makes me want to say right up front, and when I say this, some of you ladies are going to probably smile or maybe even roll your eyes, I don't know, but I, I just want to say this up front, that men do have some imperfections. <laughs> they do have some flaws. And, you know, but the thing is, is this, is, you know, we, we joke about it, but it's interesting. And, and look, I love the fact that we celebrate women and mothers the way we do. Mother's Day is the, one of the biggest celebration days of the year, and, uh, and, and rightfully so. I mean, thank God. I love and admire women. And, uh, but, but then when you come to men talking about men, that it's interesting that we find ourselves bumping up against a lot of baggage, you know, mindset baggage in our culture and our society about men, where it's like, isn't this true that, you know, when you, it comes to Mother's Day, you talk about mothers, it's like, it's all only just like, oh, beautiful, wonderful, oh, they're the greatest. When you come to them about men, everything's got a little chuckle to it, you know, a little like, you know, raised eyebrow, a little, you know, you talk about flaws and everybody goes, yeah, they got flaws. You, you know what I'm saying? But the point is, is simply this. Yes, men have imperfections, but here's the deal. If it was just your man that had imperfections, it would be one thing. Or if it was just a few men in this place or in the world or some men in the world. But all men, all men have these same imperfections. That's why, you know, we say, talk about men, you say, oh, you know, you know, people say, oh, men, you know, it's like, and, but here's the thing. God created man the way he is for a purpose. And he created, I mean, this is real, this is, this is PhD stuff, folks. You ready? He created man the way he is for a purpose, and he created woman the way she is for a purpose. It's very simple, isn't it? But we have forgotten that today. In our society, we've made it very difficult and challenging to really become a, a true man, a real man, what, the way God has designed us, because we have, we have confused the genders and come to this crazy mindset to where that, you know, we are, you know, we, we call it... Um, uh, um, anyway, whatever, Const what do they call it? Anyway, whatever it is, I don't know. <sighs> anyway, we, we have this where that men are supposed to become more feminine and women are supposed to become more masculine, you know, to where there's a blurring of the lines of manhood and womanhood and the problem with that is, is that God didn't design us that way. When we look at God's original design, he designed us about as polar opposite from each other as you can possibly be. He did. God designed us that way for a purpose. Men are so extremely different than women and women than men. And we know that. But the fact that they are that way is not our liability. It's our asset. It's the way God has designed us. Are you with me now? And I say this because what I'm contending for today is this, this thing of real manhood. 
You know, I thank God for women, as I said. I think God outdid himself on the day he made woman. You know, she, she's amazing. But I want to tell you something. Men are amazing too. Thank you for your smiling. Men are amazing when they function the way God designed them. And the way God designed them is not like a woman. Right? And so it's important for us to acknowledge these differences so that we can celebrate them instead of criticize each other for them. And really on Father's Day today, what I'm getting at is like with man, look, if God designed man the way he is, and I'm not glorifying any man's faults, you know, and failures, but, but look, you got to admit, if, if men are, if all men are this way, basically... I mean, if all men have certain characteristics, it must be the way God designed us. Are you with me now? Now, there's some things, I know there are a lot of jerks out there. There are a lot of bad apples. I'm not talking about those. But men are men for a purpose, and women are women. I used to tell, you know, love to tell this story, you know, that, you know, that I was, um, you know, I, I came home from work one day and came into the house and no, I hollered Donna and nobody answered, nobody was in the house. And so anyway, I go through the house and I make it to the bedroom and I start the open door and I, I do, I holler Donna. And when I holler Donna, opening my bedroom door, I hear coming from the walk-in closet, uh, like the loud screams of a number of female voices saying, stay out, get out. Now look, I'm coming to my bedroom. And from the closet, these female voices, oh, get out, don't come in. So look, I dutifully walked back out, went to the living room. I hung out there for you know, a little bit. And after a little bit, all of a sudden, my wife and all these women come out of the bedroom I said, what in the world were you doing in the bedroom, in the, in the walk-in closet together? And they all said, oh, we were trying on Donna's, Donna's clothes. I thought, I thought, Donna, if you came home from work and came to the bedroom door and hollered in there, Rick, and you heard from the walk-in closet a bunch of masculine voices saying, stay out. Don't come in here. You would immediately be suspicious that something was up. Because we don't walk. We wouldn't come out of the closet. You say, what are you doing in there? And they say, we were trying on Rick's clothes. <laughs> Look, men don't try on other men's clothes. There's just something about it. There's a separation there. A separation. Amen. You know, Don and I were in, we're, went out to dinner with two other couples one time, and as we're sitting to dinner, they were coming to the word, the end, and toward the end of the dinner, then one of the ladies, I forget which one it was, one of the ladies takes her purse, she gets up, and as she's getting up, she says, ladies, she says, I'm going to the bathroom. Would you all like to go with me? And I just, my head tilted, and I, I thought, look, if I had to go to the bathroom, and I all of a sudden stood up and said, uh, men, I'm going to the bathroom. Would you like to go with me? <laughs> look, men don't go to the bathroom together. When we're in the bathroom, we don't even look at each other. If you look at another man in the bathroom, it's a sign of a wrong thing. You don't talk to them. You don't look at them. And, you know, I could tell you a thousand different stories like that that basically tell us that that. Men and women are uniquely neat. And why are these things so funny? Because they seem like little quirks. You know, we don't understand. I don't, I'll be honest with you. I don't understand women. I don't understand women. And you don't understand men if you're a woman. You know, these gals, I, I, you, I'll pick up a magazine like in the grocery store line. Look at it and I'll see, because on the cover it'll say, you know, two women writing this article, you know, about 10 things that men want. 
and I, of course, I don't buy the magazine, but I just, while I'm waiting, look at the article, and, and I'll look at these 10 things, and I'll think, that's not at all what I want. <laughs> these ladies don't have any idea what I want. What, how can a lady tell me? She knows what I, and, and same with men and women. These male psychologists give, writing articles about what women want. Let me tell you something. We are so polar opposites to each other that I have found you can live together for 44 years and still not understand each other. Look, you do understand more, but so much is still a mystery. Are you with me now? But the beautiful thing is, is that over those 44 years, as you get to know the differences of each other, what, what happens is, is you begin to, once you understand what I'm talking about here today, you begin to celebrate the, th the ways your wife is different than you and the ways that your husband is different than you. Ladies, I want to tell you this. Men have a lot of imperfections and flaws, but let me, let me just tell you this, that it doesn't mean they're not a good man, and a, a good man needs to be celebrated. Are y'all still out there today, huh? It's true. A good man needs to be celebrated. So let me say this, that you, let's talk about man just for a moment. Just listen to this. I thought about this kind of stuff, you know, that man has a lot of testosterone in him, right? And I mean, you know, with some men you wonder, but but that's another story. Look, I know I make jokes about this, you know, and, I, and I, to some I may seem a little old-fashioned, but you know what? I believe this so strongly, this, that this feminization of, of manhood in our present generation, it's not a good thing. It's not an evolving into some higher form of thinking or living. It's not, it's not good. You know, I was reading in the news the other day, and I saw this article. It was actually an advertisement of this, this clothing company or fashion company who came out with this new line of clothing for men that was all lace. It was all lace clothing, lace shirts and lace shorts. And all these men were just posing, you know, with their lace shirts and lace shorts. And I think, come on, men, there's some things that women are supposed to wear. And, and, and the, I don't get this idea of, of trying to become more feminine. Because let me tell you something. Our ladies, our women, what they need is they need a man. They don't need another woman. They need a man. They need a man to be a man. Are you with me now? And we're filled with this testosterone, which makes us highly competitive and... and um, driven. And because of that, when we're not winning, anytime we're not winning, most men don't know how to deal with it very well. And the problem with, did y'all know that? Did y'all know that most men don't know how to deal with it very well when they're not winning? And the problem with that is, is that when they're not doing well or not winning, if their wife or if the woman rides him about it, if the woman rides him about it, that actually she, she'll literally destroy him further and actually cause him to look other places for encouragement because men are not motivated by criticism. They're motivated by praise. Are you with me now? It's just the way it is. You know, one of the, I, I admire my wife in so many ways, but one of the things that's so amazing about her all these years is, my wife has been so faithful in life. She's been my biggest fan. We'll travel. It happened in this trip where we're in Australia. New Zealand. People say, we had several other people say, man, you know, one re way reason I know Rick is, is, is a great guy and a, a true deal, the real deal, is because I watch his wife. And it's like she's been with him all these years. And she's, she looks at him and listens to him, you know, just like, like it's the first time she's ever heard what he's saying. And, and it's like, she's, you know, my biggest fan and she, and my wife never talks ill about me. Are y'all with me now? 
And she never runs me down. She never talks about negatively about my faults and weaknesses. Are you with me now? And that's so important because I, I function on, on, on the back of the praise of my wife. You with me now? Some praise is good and some praise is not good. You know, pastor of the world's largest church, Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho in, in Korea, South Korea, you know, he, he said the Lord spoke to him and he said, he said, whenever, whenever anybody else besides your wife praises you, when they praise you, said, just, they said, you treat it like chewing gum. Where you chew it, you get the good out of it, and you spit it out, but don't swallow it. He said, but when your wife praises you, you need to treat it like candy. Where you put it in and get all the juice out of it and then swallow it. Because it's, y'all listen to me today. Because men thrive on the praises, uh, you know, uh, of their wife. And the thing is, is this, is that to prove this is true, look, we men, here's the way we work. Can I tell you something? We men, it's like, if we're carrying two bags of groceries and, and, and the woman says to us, they, it says that, look, there's my man. He's strong. And she starts talking about how strong I am. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to throw a third bag of groceries over my shoulder and say, honey, that ain't nothing. Look what I can do. It's just the way it is. You know, my, 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 you know it's why we men, whenever, uh, even after all these years, when our wife comes and just kind of grabs us here on the shoulder, the arm, I, I also don't even think about it. You automatically begin to flex your muscles. <laughs> Isn't it true? It's like because we thrive on the praises of our wife. So don't ever, ever, don't ever live talking down your husband, your father, but talking him up, compliment him, praise him. And we men, if you praise us, we'll bend over backwards to do it better the next time. Can somebody say amen? So I want to say, uh, just listen to this real quick. I'm kind of getting several things off my chest, if you all can tell. I don't know if you can tell, but here's one of them. You know, look, I love it that I had a great dad who was, who was a real man. And he, he was a man's man. He was strong. He was a great leader, you know. He, well, he was strong in the house. I'm not saying he did everything right, you know. I mean, he, he ruled things with a, you know, an iron fist, not with his fist really, but you understand what I'm saying. In other words, he, you know, he was strong, but at the same time, my dad was loving and he was kind, you know? And, uh, and the thing is, is this, is that men, and I'm going to sound real fast when I say this, but please get this folks. Men used to be different than they are now. And what was thought to be a good man was different. Back even when I was raised as a child, if you worked hard, took care of your family, and paid the bills, people would look at you and say, now there's a good man. It didn't even matter if he didn't talk much. I mean, you know, maybe him and mama, papa and mama never even talked that much. His favorite word might have been a grunt. Honey, we going to town today? Uh. The kids say, what, what did he say? Oh, she said, yep, we're going to town. Uh. Are you with me now? But the thing is, is that if mama ever heard you talk bad about her man, she'd slap your face and tell you, don't ever talk bad about my man. He's a good man. Now, to be a good man, that's not enough. You've got to get in touch with your feelings. You've got you to get in touch with your emotions, with your feminine side. And you've got you to cry. You all still listen to me today? It's like you've got to get in touch with this whole emotional side of yourself. And it's praise. And I, I guess that's on my mind because here I'm just in Australia. And here I'm watching the news in Australia. And there in Australia, the, 
there's an affectionate term they have for men that are kind of like, you know, good old boy, strong men, and uh, just a man's man, and they call him a bloke. You ever heard that? They'll just say, he's a good old bloke. And that's a good term, an affectionate term, you know, for a guy, man, he's a good old, good man, good man. And you know what? They now in Australia have this big campaign going where they're starting small group sessions all over Australia, getting blokes together in small group settings, and they start discussing all of the things that have been wrong with being a bloke and how wrong it's been until someone starts crying in the group session, and then all the guys get up and go over and hug him, and then he apologizes for being a bloke. Y'all still out there now? And I think, my God, don't you realize you're destroying the basic fabric of civilization? You need your man to be able to get up and go to fight for that woman every morning when he gets up. Are you with me now? The main qualification is not to cry. Matter of fact, it's not just crying. You got to, you, you know, if you cry too much, you're a wimp. But if you don't cry at all, you're out of touch with your feelings. So you got to cry just the right amount. It's no wonder men are confused. Hey, it's no wonder men are confused. I guess I am advocating today for this house. Folks, listen. Let's celebrate manhood in this house. Let's celebrate strength in men. Let's celebrate boldness, leadership in men. Don't tear it down. Don't talk bad about it. Yeah, they've got faults. They've got flaws. But so, so do all the women. Are you with me now? We've all got flaws. But let me tell you something. If you've got a man who loves God, who will, if you've got a man who loves God, who will work hard, who will take care of his family, let me tell you something. You've got a good man. He may not be the biggest talker that you want him to be. There may be there's other things you'd like for him to be. Maybe there's a lot of things he's not. But let me tell you something. He's a good man. If he's a man who will take responsibility in his own personal life and in his home. Somebody shout amen. amen. Having said that, listen to this. I want to wrap this up today with a little story out of the scripture. I want to just talk to you a few minutes about a man in the Bible who was very flawed, but he loved God. And his name was Jacob. Listen to this very quickly. Jacob was raised in a dysfunctional home. His dad was very passive. His dad, in fact, his dad loved Esau, his brother, loved everything Esau did and hated everything Jacob did. Jacob couldn't do anything right to please his father. His mom didn't help. She raised him, you know, doing a bunch of girl stuff. And, and, and so... Jacob, being raised in this home, he's messed up, but he didn't get messed up by himself. He has a lot of help. And he goes through life living out. Listen to this. I, listen, think of this. He lived out what he was called. His name, Jacob, meant manipulator, trickster, schemer. And he lived out the label that was placed on him. Until he has an encounter with God, and he has this encounter with God, and God says to him, he says, J, he said, you know, God looks, said, says to him in this encounter, he says, what is your name? Listen to this. He says, my name is Jacob. Now, folks, just listen to this. Just give me some license here just for a little bit to paint this picture. Jacob had no idea who he was. You say, how do you know that? The proof of it is, is that you see his story. He lived his whole life trying to be somebody else that he thought maybe his father would love. And so you know when God says, what is your name? The only thing he knew is to, is to say what other people called him. He does that, has an encounter with God. He goes on a while. Sometime later, listen to this, Jacob has a second encounter with God. In the second encounter with God, God says again to Jacob, listen to this, he asks, he says, what is your name? 
And again, he says, Jacob. Yeah, I'm what they have called me, that label they've put on me. And God says to Jacob, he says, listen. Now, here's where I'm taking some license here to, to paraphrase this. Listen, listen. He said, that's who people have called you. That's what they've labeled you. But that's not the way I see you. That's not who you really are. And he changed his name to Israel, which means prince. I love that. He said, listen, in this raw, manipulative man who's full of these faults, he said, what I see in him is a prince with God. And when he says that, listen to this. He comes down from the mountain. Watch this. And when he comes down, he comes down with two names. He said, wait a minute, I thought God changed his name. But listen, long after Jacob was dead, when God referred to him, sometimes he referred to him as Jacob. Sometimes he referred to him as Israel. One time he'd talk about him, he'd say Israel. The other time he'd talk about him, he'd say Jacob. It's fascinating. If God kept referring to him with both names, it means that in his lifetime, when he came down from that mountain, listen, yes, God had radically changed him and made him a prince with God, but God never fully killed the Jacob inside of him. And my point is, is this, is that we're looking sometimes for this utopia of like, oh man, you know, when, when a man, you know, when he comes to God and his life gets changed, it, you know, all that stuff's going to change in him that I don't like. Let me tell you something. All of the Jacob never gets killed in us. You never kill all the Jacob in us. Why? Because God loves to use Israel's with some of their Jacob in them. I love this. Listen, we never get fully rid of the Jacob as long as we're in these physical bodies. And so he's living with this, with, with some of these flaws in him. I'll give you an example. Listen, if your husband is a non-talker, then if he has a radical encounter with God, he's not probably not going to become a talker from a non-talker. He's probably just going to be a non-talker who is filled with the Spirit of God. You listen to me now. In other words, if you got a rough and tough man, just because he has a radical encounter with God doesn't mean he's going to become domesticated. A domesticated lap dog. Y'all with me now? You know, the, the man is who he is. And God loves to take the vessels that we are and pour his Holy Spirit through us until he can shine through the cracked areas of our vessel so the glory belongs to him and not of us. Oh, I like that. So Jacob comes down from the mountain, still wrestling with some of this Jacob in him, but he's also manifesting the evidence of the Israel in him. Listen to this. He does some things that a man who has been truly sanctified by God, who's had his manhood sanctified, that a, a, that, that a, that a true man does. And that is the first thing he does when he comes down the mountain. He goes to his brother Esau, who he had been estranged from for so many years. It's the, it's the part of the family he didn't talk to, that he was mad at for many years. The first thing he does is he goes and he reconciles his relationship with Esau. So, so the, one of the signs that God is working in that flawed exterior of a man is when that man becomes a reconciler of relationships instead of a destroyer of relationships. Are you with me now? Do you see what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm advocating for con the, keeping all this stuff of the man, or even some of the flaws, but I'm not advocating for the destructive behavior that that has fallen into or eventuated into. Second thing that happens is this, and that is that Jacob sets out on a journey. Now listen to this. And when he sets out on this journey, he's on, he sets out on a journey, it says, to Succoth. Now, look, I know we've all been to Succoth. 
that's, that's all I'll say about that. But anyway, it, he, he, he sets out on the journey to Succoth. And the Bible says that the reason he sets out on this journey, the only reason is so he can find a place to build a house for his beautiful wife and kids. And I saw that. And I thought, listen, it was a long, rough journey. Rocky, hot, dry, rough roads. They were riding in a wagon. But the only reason Jacob journeyed there, it wasn't for himself. It was for so he could build a house for his wife and kids. Every good man, every good man who loves God is motivated in their actions, not by their own benefit, by what benefits them, but they're motivated by improving the life of their family that God has given them. Are you with me now? It was that beautiful wife and kids. When he sets out on, listen to this, when he sets out on this journey, the last thing is, he gets, no, no, he gets there and he builds a house. He's there for some time and he sets out on one more journey. This journey is to, play, to a place called Ephrath. Now the word Ephrath means fruitfulness. Are you ready? So it's like now they've got their homestead, they've got their house, but now Jacob says, you ready for this? He's driven, he's motivated, he's competitive. He said, come on baby, I got one more journey to take us on. It's just to this place called fruitfulness. It's this place where the, all of our dreams are gonna come to pass. We're gonna get everything that we've been wanting. It's all gonna happen. And so he sets out on this long, rough journey. And as he does, he's on a wagon. And, and if you please, where is Jacob on this wagon? Jacob is where every man is supposed to be. He's up front behind the horses with the reins in his hand, driving the horses forward while Rachel, his wife, is protected in the wagon. You all with me now? Look, and I am not, listen, I am not advocating for some role of passivity in, in woman. What I'm advocating for is this idea that we as men are designed, to, designed by God to protect our women, to live for them, our wife, our kids, and not for ourselves. Are you with me now? I still believe today if it's raining outside and you've got an umbrella, one, only one umbrella that's just big enough for one person, that you hold the umbrella over her and you get wet. Y'all still out there today. Look, I still believe that's the... You live to protect that gal in the wagon, to make her feel secure, loved, embraced. But here's the thing, listen to this. The problem is, is that men live with this struggle between how do I stay up front behind those horses working hard to drive us forward and at the same time stay, get back in the wagon to where my wife and kids won't feel I'm neglecting them. Every man struggles with that. And Jacob blew it because here he's driving the horses forward. Babe, we're going to get there. Bang, bang, shh, come on. And he didn't know it while he is driving the horses forward. Something's wrong with Rachel back in the wagon. She's pregnant and she's starting to have this baby and things aren't going well. She's in hard labor and it ends up the midwife's back there with her and she ends up delivering the baby and as the baby comes out, she dies. Jacob gets off of the horses, goes back there, picks up his beautiful love of his life in his arms. And I'm sure at that moment, Jacob realized, my God, I spent too much time preoccupied up there driving the horses that I didn't know what was going on back in the wagon. But the problem is, is this is if you spend too much time focusing on driving the horses, then you, 
you don't know what's going on back in the wagon. But if you just stay back in the wagon all the time, then nothing's moving forward. And what I'm trying to say, I'm not giving you an answer. I'm just trying to tell you that's a dynamic that all men struggle with. And if you'll just realize that he's struggling with that, that there's this motivation in him to get up behind those horses and say, babe, I'm taking us there. We're going to get there. We're, I'm driving it hard. But at the same time, live with the other side of that tension to where that you make sure you know what's going on in the wagon. Y'all with me now? Where you make sure that you're there. I love this statement that it says that Jacob slowed down to the pace. His kids were getting tired. And so he slowed down to the pace of kids. his kids. He finally realized that I can't go at my own pace. I've got to go at the pace of my family. Are y'all still out there today? Hallelujah. Men are absolutely wonderful. Women are absolutely wonderful. Let's realize the great treasures that God has given each of us. Are y'all with me now? Come on, give the Lord praise in this place today. Stand to your feet, if you will.